So, Heavenly Father, thank you um, for being who you are, being sovereign, God, and being glorious and gracious in all that you provide for us, all that you do for us, God, and providing for our families and our health, God, and so thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here tonight, God, and standing here and leading prayer. I pray that um, it always, as always, it brings glory to your name, and I don't get in the way of your spirit, Father, and so we ask for favor the church body God to have um, a clear vision for stepping out in in a timely manner and helping those that are in need um, from the uh, flooding and the hurricane and whatever other doors you will open up for us God to be a blessing to our community as a whole we ask that you would um, put upon the hearts of the folks here, God, to um, become part of the church body and lend a hand or a foot or an arm or an eye or whatever it is, God, that, or even a word of encouragement or some, some talent to the work day, uh, just to bring that with them, God, uh, whether it be some food for the folks that show up or maybe a prayer and those who want to come and can't come God I ask that you would just um, bless their hearts Father and give them peace and we pray for the church body here God to come together as one and and doing your work and we ask that tonight that you would just be with us here at the Bible study as we read through your word of Nehemiah 9, that we be encouraged in the leadership of Nehemiah in the words of Ezra, Father. And so I look up to you, the leadership here at the church and all the men that are here tonight and their families, God, that encourage them to be in a men's Bible study, uh, to hear from you. And we, we, that we can all just... Uh, get something. God, I ask you again, just be with us and be with the ladies tonight in their Bible study as they call upon your name, God, to uh, fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit and leading them as they walk uh, by faith, Father. Um, Again, just to be with us here tonight as we study your word. I'm sure there's plenty more that we can pray for. God, all night. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, gentlemen, it's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Good to be standing up in the house of the Lord again. And um, the man said, I may not be where I thought I would be, but at least I'm here. And, um, yeah, man, good to be here, bro. And so... Um, <laughs> I could go on a, on a list today to tell you what all has happened, but it ain't going to do no good. So, um, I don't have my uh, password to my computer, so I'm kind of going off memory at this point. Uh, I'm, my uh, home computer crashed on me, so I'm using my work computer, but I left the password at home, so... My notes were on there, so whatever I wrote down, I just, anyway. So anyway, we're in the book of Nehemiah. This is uh, chapter 9. We're going to be reading through chapter 9. Um, chapter 9 is a, uh, um, a coming together of the children of Israel. Again, uh, they are at the completion of the building of the wall and they have come together as a body 
as a nation to worship God. And we have here, uh, I think it's the Levites who are leading this prayer, because this is a prayer. Again, um, we're in the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. And so as a reminder, uh, I'm looking down because I'm trying to remember what, I'm, what, I, what I was going to say. And uh, as a reminder, that's uh, we kind of give a, a high overview, I guess is it what they call it, what I had was going to say. So um, the book of Nehemiah traces events from around uh, 445 B.C., which is the, the 20th year of Artaxerxes. The one until about uh, until after uh, 432 uh, BC, uh, the 32nd year of Artaxerxes. And then Nehemiah was the cupbearer of King Xerxes of Persia. This again, this is a recap of who we're talking about. If you haven't been at the Bible studies uh, leading up to this point, again, it's always good to kind of recap who we're talking about here and what it is we want to get out of the book. And um, so when Nehemiah heard um, about the ruined condition of Jerusalem, he earnestly prayed for God's help. God's answer came through Artaxerxes. If you've seen the movies, uh, I guess 300, you know that Artaxerxes wasn't a believer. So um, who sent um, Nehemiah to Judah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah organized and motivated the people and then led them with uh, courage and integrity through times of resistance from outside enemies. That was back in chapter 4 and chapter 6 and conflict within the community. And that was revisited in chapter 5. And so despite strong opposition, uh, under Nehemiah's leadership, people rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. If I remember correctly, the previous attempt was six months, if I'm not mistaken. And so, uh, so following the completion of the walls, the account focuses, talking about Nehemiah, this chapter nine, this whole book here, the account focuses on religious reforms that were led by Ezra and Nehemiah and so at the annual festival of shelters, Ezra read from the books of Moses to the crowd, resulting in a revival and a long prayer of confession. And then during this revival, the Israelites committed not to intermarry with foreigners and not to profane the Sabbath. And so that's kind of where we are uh, up to this point. Again, when you go into chapter 10, you begin to see all of the uh, promises that the children of Israel uh, make um, in, a, in addition to the uh, commitment to follow the Lord. There is also a commitment to tithe and all sorts of things. Um, not again, again, not to intermarry. We'll see in this prayer um, some of that, um, some of that uh, recognition that. Um, the intermarrying with the other pagans, I guess you would call them, uh, was a, an abomination to the Lord. And so they were, they come in this prayer to separate themselves from that. So, and a few other things. And of course, we'll stop and be mindful, I guess a word I have circled here, of some of the things that had transpired. Again, this is mainly a, uh, a uh, synopsis of what has happened to the children of Israel up into this point, just as a reminder. Um, and so we'll start off with, um, again, we're covering the whole chapter tonight, so if I go fast or if there's something that I miss uh, saying, um, then write it down. Um, I guess you could hand it to me or ask me about it later, or you can go and read it and remind yourself about it later on because as always as when you're reading the word or when you're hearing the word being read 
then you're gonna, you're, there's always, the Holy Spirit always reminds you of something in Scripture um, that probably pertains to uh, something here or maybe it's something that you read or something that you've experienced in your own life that um, there's a Scripture that reminds you of what you read and then, um, again, just uh, to... Uh, get those juices flowing. So with further ado, we'll go ahead and start with uh, chapter 9. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. I had the New Living Translation, but that's generally for small children. So, But if uh, there's anyone who would prefer that I read from the version that's um, more English friendly, I guess, then I will. If not, I'll read from the New King James Version. All right, and then uh, we'll go from there. So now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting. Uh, I believe in my notes I was looking up the word fasting. Remember that, you know, when I see the word fasting, I always think of food. Um, but I believe in the book of Acts, there is uh, also just an encouragement to draw nearer to the Lord. It doesn't always have to be with food. And and the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, I think there is a misconception a lot of times and when people hear the word fasting, they think of food. And so just for you who may think or maybe been brought up kind of like I was, and you hear the word fasting, you think of food, it's not always about food. Okay, it's all, you'll see here that, uh, we keep reading, um, that they were just really concentrating on being focused on the Lord at this moment. That was their fasting. That was what they were concentrating to do. So um, if you ever think about fasting, all, sometimes you can just think about it as drawing nearer to God, all right? Being very intentional. I think the word is hot around here now, be, being very intentional about drawing nearer to him. So assemble with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Again, this is you see this a lot in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures where a lot of grieving uh, is going on here, um, dusting, throwing dirt on themselves and walking around in sackcloth, so, um, a outward sign of grief. And so th in chapter, paragraph 2, then those of Israelite lineages separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. This is one of the lines that kind of, you know, I was doing some research on it, and I really couldn't, I really didn't understand what it was trying to say here, um, except that they were just, they were confessing their, their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. I guess if you read it, they're reminding themselves of what their fathers did so that they wouldn't do it again. It's not, my initial thought was, well, why would you have to confess for someone else? The, their iniquities. Why would you confess for them? Um, because you can only confess for your own sins and because you're only accountable for your own. Um, and so, anyway, so in, in verse 3, it says, They stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshiped with their God. So I stopped here again. I said, Well, that's, you know, 50% of the day, what they do for the other 50% of the day. So that's, right? So I guess the, I guess in keeping with the theme of the chapter, I guess they continue to worship. You know, I guess in the, <laughs> when they, um, back in the old days, and you used to go to church all day long, and then they would take a break, and then they would come back for the other half, you know. So this may be uh, one of those event. This is a festival, of course, so and a big revival, so I would imagine they had to take a break. As it says here, they were standing up for three hours, and so that's a long time to listen uh, to the word standing on your feet. I think I've heard it say once before that just think if we had to stand on our feet nowadays rather than sit in these red chairs to hear the word of God, how, different, how much different it would be. But then we have here in verse 4, we have... Um, then Joshua, Benai, Cadmiel, uh, Shambaniah, Bunai, 
Zerubiah, Bani, and Chenal stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice uh, to the Lord their God. Did I miss a, did I miss a verse? Okay, then Levites, then, then the Levites, Jeshua, Kanmil, Bani, Haspan, Benja, I can't say it right, Sherebiah, Hodajai, Sarah, Bani, and Panthea said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be your glorious name. Now, of all these guys that are listed here, you know, there are, in the second group, in chapter 5, or in verse 5, one guy is missing, and that is this uh, gentleman named uh, uh, Shin, Shin and I. And then they added uh, uh, Haza, Benajai, Hojanai, and Penthahiah. So, I mean, looking up these names of these guys, you know, all these guys' names are um, synonymous with um, uh, God being with us. And so, or, um, uh, or the providence of God. And so it's always interesting, these names, uh, especially during these times of worship, who, who's there and what their names mean. I, I think I kind of get that from uh, listening to Pastor David. You know, these names, sometimes these names can kind of line up and really give you a cool sentence at some, some points. Um, but in this instance, these guys' names just mean worshipers of God. It's ironic that uh, these guys are all Levites. And so they have these godly names, I guess like the name of James is a godly name. Um, if you're looking at the Hebrew scriptures as well, and I'm sure some of you all have those same names from your Christian mothers and fathers who named you at birth. And so uh, it's a glorious thing. And then so going on we say, which is exalted above all blessing and praise you alone are the Lord you have made heaven the heaven and of heavens with all their host the earth and everything on it the seas and all that is in them and you preserve them all the host of heaven worships you all right in chapter 7 verse 7 you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the same the name Abraham you found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, Hittites and Amorites, the Perizzites Jebusites and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants you have performed your words for you are righteous again a reminder if you're looking at the uh the New Testament, where in the book of Romans, Paul begins to talk about faith of Abraham, and if Abraham's faith was accounted to him before he was circumcised, and the answer is no. And then so, begin the faith of the individual is what God is looking for. Again here, Abraham was blessed with all of the promises of God because of his faith in God, not because of his work, not because of what he could do for God, but because of his faith. And it was the promise to give it to his descendants. And it says, you have performed your words for you are righteous. Remember, God will always keep his promises. I think that sometimes when we go through things, we get ready to pray as this as we are doing here now, this assembling of these individuals, they are in the right places. Everybody has an appointed place to be in. You have the Levites at the top of the stairs. He is ascending up to the house of God, and they are calling out, and they are praying. And these individuals are designated to do just this. And they are recognizing God, the creator of heaven and earth, for who he is. And they are remembering that their forefather, Abraham, was called out, and you found that God found his heart faithful, faithful. And this should be a reminder for us all that, uh, you know, God has chosen and uh, found us to be faithful, and by our faithfulness, he makes us right. 
I had that written down in, I think that's Romans 5, 5 and 14, I believe it was. I don't, I don't have my notes. But. So in, in 9, you are the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. Again, a reminder, you showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. Again, there's this word, uh, the word proudly here, meaning um, uh, proudly. I think it would say we're ostentatious. Um, um, anyway, you, you, proudly is good enough. And so, so you made a name for yourself, and it is as it is this day. And you divided the, the sea before them. Now, the, the previous uh, sentence there, though, you made a name for yourself as it is this day. Some, I think later on it uses the word everlasting. Your name is everlasting. Um, the one of the references that they use here in everlasting comes from Isaiah. When they give God his name as everlasting, the um, prin prince of peace and everlasting, meaning that this is, there has no beginning and there has no end to what um, his name means, I guess. Um, it, I think the commentary was that you really can't um, uh, parallel those two verses, but, even, but the word everlasting meaning that it's, there is no end to what he can do for his name. And then so in 9 it says, you saw the affliction, again, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people in his, of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself as it is this day. And you divided the, the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the, on the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep, and a stone into the mighty waters, as, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them to precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven from their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go into the, go into possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Again, we should... You know, we are always reminded what we should always pray and, re and, and remember as we are praying what God has brought us through. Um, so, so often, I believe, even I, you know, I for, have a tendency to forget, you know, um, what all I have come through and what I've been through. Um, as I press on into the day, uh, some of the days can be pretty difficult. Um, but then I'll say to myself, you know, well, what, remember what God has brought you through. And, um, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, a little, uh, it's a reminder, but it doesn't get me past that moment right away. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't get me past that moment right away. Um, it generally takes someone to come along um, and be the voice of the Holy Spirit and remind me that uh, it's been a long journey and God has really brought you through a lot um, to remind me and to, I guess, help me humble me to, to really sit back and understand that yes he has and that I need to be again the word here mindful of those things all the time and so in verse 16 it says but they but they and our fathers acted proudly hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments and they refused to obey 
and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. You know, it's, um, again, to be mindful of those things. As you go about your day, uh, when you encounter others, and as you're praying, to be mindful of the things that God has done for you. And says they're hardened their necks. So hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. Again, this is Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, the books run parallel. And they're both, I won't say basically, but uh, they're communicating the same message uh, as they pray. And they had these revivals of the children of Israel. And they're reminding them exactly what has transpired. Hired. You know, I heard one person say the other day, says, you want me to, what did they say? How did they say that? It says uh, something about their ancestors. You want me to remember or forget what your ancestors have been through? He says, well, what do you mean? See, my grandmother and them? <laughs> you know, so, you know, this to the children of Israel at this point, you know, this was way before their time. You know, so, in, in some of the uh, old religions, I guess, you know, there was, no, um, there was no Bible, there was no written communication, so the word of mouth was all that was there. And so um, maybe these miracles were not handed down, or maybe they're in their, in their uh, quest of seeking God, they got mixed up in all of these other religions, and so they uh, formulated their own religion. Um, I think I was listening to uh, what's the guy's name? Can't think of his name. Um, Grace to you. Uh, I can't think of his name. But anyway, he was. He kind of alluded to something to this effect. Whereas you know if you're not in the body of Christ and you're picking, I guess you could use a word we can use, picking from each pastor or each teaching, you know, maybe it's a Christian teaching that you're listening to. If you're picking from each teaching and you never attend a body of Christ or don't belong to a church home, then what you're doing is you're basically making up your own religion and so you know like for example uh, he used uh, uh, what do we have here uh, live stream you know you're live streaming every Thursday or you're live streaming Pastor David on Thursday you're live streaming this person on this day you're listening to this radio station this day you're listening to that radio station that day you know you're piecing together a good example was a guy was um Ever heard of Nick Cannon? Nick Cannon. Um, he was on he was on Nickelodeon. He's a black guy. He's on Nickel, Nick, Nickelodeon, and he has a show called uh, Wild and Out. Um, and he was uh, married to uh, Mariah Carey. Anybody know Mariah? Okay. So anyway, he grew up in a Christian home. This is just a short example. He um, began to wear these uh, these turbans, these I dream of genie turbans with these. Uh, diamonds in the middle, right? And um, they asked him, you know, what was the, the significance of the turban? And so he says, well, I, had, I grew up in a Christian home. I began to search out other religions. He said, and so what I did was I picked what I wanted from each religion, and I came up with my own belief. Same concept. And so uh, I just found it ironic that it was, I'm sure there's lots of other examples, uh, just that I was always curious why he wore that turban on his head. Because um, it looked kind of goofy. I thought it was a style or something. I said, was well, that a style? But it's, it's not a style. It's it, his part of his religion, right? And then so we have here the children of Israel, you know, again, marrying outside of, their nation, and they are encompassing all these other gods into worshiping. And then here we are now uh, having a prayer for the nation of Israel to come back 
to God. So they were not mindful of your wonders that you did not that you did among them, but they hardened their necks. They didn't want to change what they had been previously doing. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. That's a wonderful thing to know. That's always, um, I guess you want to say, hidden in the, uh, in, in, the, in the gym there. It says, you know, that, but you are God, ready to pardon gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. So no matter how far away you may stray, God is always ready to pardon. He's always gracious, and he's merciful. And he's always slow to anger, abundant in kindness. So remember that whenever you think that somehow you've strayed too far, it's always good to come back and remember just that you don't have, I think one of the things is that you don't have to try to see so far that's my problem I try to see so far into the future you know rather than dealing with the here and the now and understanding exactly that God is merciful and he is gracious today all right you can only do it for today in verse 18 even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar out of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, not the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they, and the way they should go. So you also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manner from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Again, God's spirit is upon the children. He's given it to them freely, even though some of us or some of them have wanted to stray and go back to where they came from. And moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Shehom, the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan, Verse 23, you also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, as you promised, and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go and to possess. So the people went in and possessed the land and subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them un into their hands with their kings and the people of the land and they might, as, that they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and a rich land and possessed the house full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and they were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. What does that sound like, man? That sounds like, you know, you, the goodness of God, he's going to give you everything. He promised to, to provide for you. You're going to eat fat on the land, and you still won't be satisfied. Verse 26, Nevertheless, they were just disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and killed your prophets, who testified against you and turned them to yourself. And they worked to great provocations. And therefore you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. Now, I was reading this, you know, I, I wonder, I, <laughs> like, you know, how many, how many folks, I think they always say what they say. Why do good things happen to bad people? I guess it's a, it's a counter argument for what I'm about to say. But there are so many folks who, I mean, just, you know, nations of people who have just been slaughtered for no reason. You know, I mean, you wonder, 
you know, I think the Bible says who sinned, his mother or his, or his people. He said nobody, you know. And I guess the end of the question is human beings are just evil, you know. And it's a sad, it's a sad story. Even in uh, today's times, you know, you find um, all of these things that are happening and you wonder in, in I guess, 2,018 years after Christ died for the sins of all human beings, you know, what does it take for all of us to come to a, have a kumbaya, I guess, um, and understand exactly that um, we're all here on this earth together. We all have to learn to live together, no matter, no matter what, you know, um, I think at some point we'll all be our own self-destruction. And then we have here in verse 28, but after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore you left them in the hand of their enemies again. And so they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven. And many, and many times you delivered them according to your mercy. Just cry out, he's there, and testify against him that you may, you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, tipping their neck, and would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit and your prophets. Yet they would not listen. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. What is that in Psalms uh, 105? I think it is. Was it 105? 105, 106? I think David, what does David say? Um, what does David say? It's a song. You guys know the song. They play it all the time around here. Let's see. Somebody sing it. Somebody knows it. Let's see. I think we even... Chanted sometime in the in the sanctuary. Let's see. Mercies are good forever. Is that what it says? Yeah, his, his, and his righteousness endures forever. Psalms one eleven says it. In Psalms one oh six, I believe that says it says it too, right? Or is it one oh five? Oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praises? Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation. God's mercy endures forever. Is it 105? Yeah. One of those two. But the point is that God's mercy will endure forever. Is it 136? I got my numbers maxed up. Is it one third? I think you're correct. I must have missed a number. I guess I was lucky and found one in there, a verse in there. Yeah, but you, I mean, the, you guys get the point. It's amazing how um, in this chapter that a lot of these, uh, what they're saying, David also uh, reiterates or repeats here in his Psalms as well. And now therefore, in verse 32, now, now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who, whose covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers, and all, and our fathers, and on all your people, for the days of the kings of Syria until this day. However, you are just in all that has befallen us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers 
have kept your law. What is that Romans road right there, correct? Neither our kings nor our priests, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies with which you testified. We said, none is righteous, no, not one. For they have not served you in their kingdom or in the many good things that you have gave them or in the large and, large and rich land which you set before them, nor did they turn from their wicked works. Here we are, servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers to eat, eat its fruits and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it, and it yields much increase to the kings. You have set over us because of our sins, and also have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and priests seal it. Again, and in chapter 10, it goes on with this uh, continuation of this prayer and with this, um, I guess, this uh, speech, I guess you want to call it. And then it has all of the those who are promising to live by uh, their word um, and their promise to God to keep his covenants and the law. Um, I think I walk away from this in remembering that, you know, I think in the New Testament it always says, you know, be doers of the word rather than just hearers of the word. That is always a, uh, a, a verse that all of us are very familiar with and we hear quite a bit, you know, and we can probably, I'm pretty sure somebody in this room can probably quote it verbatim back to back about six times in a row. But the, the biggest takeaway from that is, you know, I think Tom always says it a lot. He says, you know, <laughs> let your no's be no, let your yes be yes. No is a complete sentence, and yes is a complete sentence as well. So always keep your word. You know, uh, I, think they, I think we sent out a, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, lineup for men's uh, Bible study. I'm not sure when it came out. Uh, of course, I had, if you all not familiar, I had an uh, accident that paralyzed me from the waist down back in February. And um, I haven't been able to do a whole lot, um, but except put my trust in the Lord. Um, now, have I always been faithful in reading and studying and prayer? No, I'm not even going to sit up here and, and pretend like that's been one of those things. Um, I have been uh, really struggling, um, but nevertheless, you know, I have always kept my eyes focused on God. Um, and so I say that to say that, you know, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. But always, no matter what happens, you know, I didn't know what today was going to be or what, what, what today was going to bring. I committed to be here back when you sent out that thing. I don't even know when it was at this point. I just know he asked me, was I going to come? And I told him, I said, I should be ready to be there by September. And I looked at that date on my calendar every day. I said, I don't know if I'm going to make it. <laughs> you know, and believe me, I've probably had or could come up with a million excuses for not being here. Um, number one, I don't drive. Um, and so it was, again, I have to ask my wife to bring me, number one. I thought I was going to be driving by now. I was going to drive myself. That didn't happen. But I committed to be here on this day. And so I want to encourage you guys in, in, the same, in the same breath, man. If you set something to do for the Lord, make sure you do it. Make sure you do it. Um, it'll pay off in dividends right before your eyes. I think this is probably the longest I've stood up in eight months. 
I think I haven't. When I was, I'm sitting there for wondering, I said, at some point my legs are going to start hurting <laughs> and they're going to give out. But that hasn't happened. And, I, and it's just and it's a testament to God's grace and God's mercy. Um, and I don't know what I'll feel like when I, when I get out of here, but you know what I'm talking about, right? And, uh, but praise God, man. Praise God, man. Just um, I want to encourage you guys, man, just, just by, if I can just be standing up here and encourage you guys, man. And, you know, don't lose, don't lose, don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. You know, that hope thing, you not sight by not seeing, don't lose faith. Don't lose faith, man. Just don't lose faith. Keep plugging. Plug every day like Nehemiah. You know, he's got people here that's depending on him. That's, um, he's facing opposition on all sides. And he's leading a group of people who probably don't even want to go where he's leading them. And so he's still positive. He's still praying. You know, is he, is he a perfect human being? I doubt because he's a human being. But he's Nehemiah. And he's been called by God to go build this wall. And he accomplished it. And the people are being blessed by it. As, as the scripture says here that, you know, when they begin to read the word, the Holy Spirit overfilled them or infilled them to confess their sins at that moment. Now what they did later, you'll see. But at that moment, they recognized that they weren't perfect, that they had to change. They got to do something different in order to make a difference. And I think that God blesses, the Bible, this passage says that God blesses that. He says that when they messed up, he corrected them. But when they cried out, he pulled them back in. The same thing goes for me. The same thing goes for all of us. We're not going to always want to uh, cry out to the Lord. <laughs> You're not going to always want to do that. I mean, if you, if you always want to cry out to him at all the time, let me know. Because I need some pointers to help me always want to cry out to him or just cry out, period. 